Hello, everybody. I'm Parth. And I'm Shoya. And this is going to be our brand new intro. Until someone complains about it too much. Page by page, one day before a task or quiz, we've got you. You'll be a steadier, fighting, braving the elements, Mendeley and genetics. So to kill off your power, you'll be a procrastinator. Setting till the last minute, all you gotta do is cram. Pulling on all nighter just to give it your best shot. You can we teach, you can and we'll do the rest. So that was our new intro. I hope all of you liked it. Now we're gonna go on to the basics of circles. If you guys feel like, you know, everything on this little page thing, then I suggest you move on to the next one especially if you're cramming. Although if you do want a brief refresher, then feel free to watch it. So now we're gonna talk about the first main thing, which is gonna be the radius. And that little pink point is gonna be the center point. Probably before we talk about the radius, we should talk about the center point. That's the center of the circle. So that little pink line that Shoya has drawn from the center point to the edge of the circle, that is gonna be known as a radius. And it can be symbolized with a lowercase r. Not a capital R, because, because physics has to rob us of all our capital letters. But now if we double this radius or we extend it from this end to the other, that makes a diameter. And a diameter is going to be known as 2r or with a lowercase d. And the way that you can find the diameter if you don't uh, know it and you know the radius is going to be just 2 times r. I already stated that. So yeah, that's going to be the diameter. Although we do have a little thing with the diameter. The diameter must edge must start from one edge of the circle to the other, but it must path, pass through the center point. Now, if we have a line that short is drawn, that is being known as a chord, a line that connects from one edge of the circle to the other edge. And the diameter is actually going to be a type of chord, but the diameter is going to be special in that it passes through the center point. So any line that you draw in a circle that connects from one end to the other is going to be known as a chord. It's um, kind of like fact, how the longest chord will be the diameter. Anyway, that is true. So, yeah, now we're going to move on to the circumference. The circumference is going to be that little blue outline. It's going to basically be the perimeter. So in quadrilles, you have a perimeter, right? It's going to basically be that. It's going to be whatever surrounds it. So you see that little arrow that passes through it. That's going to be the circumference. And this can be represented with an equation known as 2 pi r or pi d. And now you might be wondering, what is pi? Well, it's a very tasty meal and it's especially good for dessert, but that's gonna be the wrong pi. This pi is gonna be a special kind of pi. It's gonna be a mathematical constant. Let me pull up my notes. Let me pull up my notes. It's gonna be exactly the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter. And it's gonna be represented as 3.1415926, but no one really cares beyond the 3.14 in a basic algebra or geometry class. Now, when you grow up, you're probably not going to be using 22 sevenths as pi. However, in basic classroom instruction material, 22 sevenths will be easily used because it's a nice fraction that children can use very easily. It's going to be slightly off from 3.1415925, but it is close enough for classroom experience. Now, that you know what pi is, and now you know what the circumference is. The circumference is the outside. What about the inside down that area? I sound way too enthusiastic about area. But you know, area is going to be represented with pi r squared. That's going to be our equation, and that's just going to be the radius squared times pi. And now for both the circumference and the area, Many teachers and many people won't actually request you to multiply um, your radius squared times pi. You could probably, so let's say our radius was three. Three squared is gonna be nine. Nine pi could be our area. Mo many people won't have you multiply nine times 3.14159 or pi. But that's just something that um, I feel that I need to clarify just in case. Um, so the reason for that obviously is pi is irrational and since it goes on forever you cannot you can never like properly multiply it by something so if you want an exact answer three pi will always always be more accurate than multiplying three times three dot one four one five i mean you can go on forever and it'll still not yeah. be as accurate that's as something three. very important you should that. remember about pi it's irrational i forgot to mention it very sorry, but we have brought it up, so hopefully you do have some clarity about that. Now we're going to be moving on to endpoints, and an endpoint is basically just going to be 
from one area to the other. So this point is going to be labeled as A, and this other point is going to be labeled as B. It's pretty simple, pretty self-explanatory, not that hard. So now Shorty is going to be explaining line through point, something I have an intense fascination with. Okay, I really don't. So it's very this boring This one's actually me. quite annoying. So this could take a second. Most people will just tell you, hey, if you just do this with this number and this number, you'll get something. But that's not the important part. We want to find for any number what line will go through that point. So let's start with a number. Parth, give me a number. Four. No, I meant like app. Oh, okay. I'm going to say app. Another number. You said number. Number is not the same okay, as a letter. Give me a variable. Variable. C. C. Another one. Star. No. Okay, D. So I usually use X, Y, but part wants to be special, so here we are. Um, so now, also, um, let's say we start with slope point form. Let's just start with a normal line, okay? Y is equal to... We start with slope point form. Let's just start with a normal line, okay? Y is equal to MX plus B. Most annoying formula that... Actually, it's not the most. It's an annoying formula you have Quadratic to Quadratic formula is far now, more annoying. Now, we can just... Get, I'll just go ahead and explain that again for a little bit. Uh, we got this B is is coming down here, and we are plugging in C, and we are plugging in D because we need to have um, we need for some X we need to have this value of Y, and this is the value we want. So we plug that in. Parth, can you get rid of this nonsense? Okay, thank you. Um, now if we go ahead, we can solve this equation using this. And then move down here, and we have our solved equation where b is equal to d minus c. And now we want to plug in d minus c as b. Since they're equal, we can just put them into our original formula, which now creates y is equal to x plus d minus c. I'm sorry for not scrolling down sooner. And here we have it on a Cartesian plane. It's not the prettiest Cartesian plane, but it does the job. Um, this will basically make it so we have x, so x will look something like that. And then what d minus c is doing is it's changing the height. So let's say cd was actually up here. The line would look like this now. If it was down here, it would look like this. Oh, and it's decided it wants to make a parallelogram. Anyway. Let's move on to midpoints and distance. Okay, so if you know the midpoint and distance formula, I recommend you don't skip this one because we do it a lot differently and explain how each of these were. However, if you're in a, if you're in a time crunch, skip on ahead to the circle equations. Now, let's go. So if we start with our distance formula, which we will base our midpoint formula on, we first actually are starting with the Pythagorean theorem. So, if I always use a squared is equal to b squared, but apparently people like this better. Um, yes, this is a triangle. Now get it out of my sight. Anyway, um, why is this important? Well, obviously, this shows that if you have a triangle like this, and this is a, and this is b, and this is c, then if those are side lengths, that is true. This thing right up here. And that can be super useful. Now, why does this matter for something like distance? Well, let's draw distance a little bit differently. So here's our starting point, And uh, here's our ending point. And we got a line going between them. We got A, we got B. Well, if you notice, we can uh, make a little right triangle. Okay, fine. I'll make it pretty, part. Thank you. Um, prettier? Okay. Yes. So this will be side C. Um, sorry, corner C. So if you notice something, these corners look a whole lot like this one up here. And if we have our D, E, F for side lengths, when we're looking for distance, we are looking for F. Okay, so all our equations are based off f. So f is equal, f squared is equal to d squared plus e squared. Now, can we figure out what d and e are? Well, 
Let's just start with what B and A are relative to each other. Now, this can be anywhere on the uh, Cartesian plane, and it literally does not matter. But let's just say that relative to each other, if this is X and Y, and this is D and, uh, no, the, actually, we've, we've used D. Parth, give me a letter. Uh, see, uh, we already used that, X and Y. We already used that. G and H. Oh. We have 26 okay. characters. Don't, so, don't, don't, don't mess it up. If we have X and Y, now, we know that D, the distance of D, must be, okay, I, I see what you want to do there. Um, we see that the distance D must be equal to X minus G. Now, this can be the other way around. So the triangle can be like this. It can be like this. It doesn't it, the matter. The orientation doesn't matter at all. Now, what this does mean, though, is it's possible for this to be negative. And this is a distance. And so we need to make sure that's positive. Now, we have E. We get E, and we just do the same thing, except for Y. Prepare now, to scroll! Yes. Now, we need to make sure that... Um, we need to make sure that on this, we... Uh, sorry, part's part distracting me. We need to make sure that X and Y... If, if X is first, Y has to be first. If G is first, H has to be first. Because otherwise, your distance isn't actually accurate. Now... G can be first, but if G is first, H also has to be first. So if you do that, you also have to do that. Now, um, let's go ahead and go on further. Now, we have now what this is. Let's go ahead and make a formula out of this. F squared is equal to, um, now D squared. So, uh, absolute value, X minus G whole square plus and now we do e y minus h whole square and that's the entire thing except we just want f not f uh, squared and since i am a lazy person who does not like to write things over and over again copy come on let me paste seems to not be letting me paste and since i'm still a lazy person i'm gonna write it for you we are gonna do that oh that would be actually very nice um if part's writing it for us we just we take off our squared and instead we have a square root clearly our handwritings are the exact same no difference here i i don't see it um now if we go ahead and look at our formula we notice, you know, prepare scroll. to scroll. Um, ah, right. I got to scroll here. Uh, we can see that it's actually the same. It's the exact same formula. Granted, Since in the distance formula, we use things. X and Y. Since but we other are squaring than that. things, the absolute value, actually, you can leave out. But in your head, it's easier if you just do it. Now, while on like a quiz or a test, you can't really do this in your head. If this is competition math, it is worth it to do this in your head and only write this uh, this one equation right here. That's it. That's all you need to write. Write that out with D, E, and F being actual like things, and then you're done. So that's what the distance formula is. But now I want to find a midpoint. So we're going to scroll a little bit. Um... And let's go ahead and let's say that this is our line again. This would be our midpoint. M. Okay. Right in the center. Also label the endpoints. So yeah. let's call so this A. A. Let's call this B. And B. Okay. Um, well, Parth, that, that doesn't work. These have to be capitalized. Don't mess that one up. Yeah. Because they are points. Okay. So now... AM, points must always be capitalized. If we want this to be a midpoint, AM has to be equal to uh, MB. 
Um, now we can see that these are equal. Oh, I should move this away so I have a little bit more room. Those to little draw. ticks that he wrote means that each line segment is going to be this exactly is. the same. Now, um, we can go ahead and again draw our triangle out of this. But what does it help us making this triangle? Well, we can see that this, if this is half of this side, if we use triangle sim similarity, I don't know if you guys have learned this yet, but basically, if this is half of this, this is also half of this. And this, this bit, is half of that. So, basically, you don't need to really do anything. All you need to do is go ahead, make a little big old bracket, and start with, okay, so if we take what we learned from above, we can see that the difference between this, uh, this side right here, we can see that it is the, uh, we do our little x, y, and I think it was g, h. h, we can just start with x minus g, and then we just want the middle, so we just divide it by 2. And we go ahead, do that with y, and we do y minus h. Now, the reason it's important to know this is not because you'll ever have to draw this out on a quiz. Most of the time, the, if you're asking for a proof, it'll be a lot more writing and a lot less drawing. But knowing this in your head means that if you want to do, a, let's say, after a problem on a quiz, a quick sanity check to just make sure you got it right, you can go ahead and in your mind be like, okay, subtract, divide by two, instead of, oh, I accidentally wrote plus on my equation. You know, that that kind of mistake just can't happen. And mis uh, sanity checks are like really useful on quizzes. It seems to be like, if you have time, a sanity check is a really good way to get more points on a quiz. Um, Indeed. There this you really go. Helped both of us. This is the actual equation if some person decides hey, let's go ahead and make them write this on an actual quiz. So now we're going to talk about circle equations and how to manipulate them. Now we're going to be only extremely into depth about this and like how this is going to actually work. So if you do want to skip it, just keep in mind you're going to be missing crucial information that could potentially help you. Because we're not just going to be going over the borderline basics, we're going to be going really in depth and this can help you on your next test or quiz. But my waffling aside, let's move on. So this is going to be the equation x minus h in parentheses squared plus y minus k in parentheses squared equals r squared. You see a pattern? That's all squared. Yay. My, my yay was kind of enthusiastic. But you know, it's yay. So the H and the K are actually going to be our center. And that's going to be the center point. And let's call it center. And the R is going to be the radius. We talked about that earlier on. And if you are any student of uh, algebra geometry, you should probably know that already. Now, you might notice how the negative h and the negative k are written in the equation. And that's actually going to be because it's an inverse. If you have a positive h value, it's going to be written as a negative h in the equation. And if you have a negative h, it's going to be written as a positive h. So it's just going to be counter. I will explain be a little... Yeah, we will explain why below. It's actually for a really good reason, but it is a little confusing. So just keep that in mind. And now the r squared, we do have one little caveat here. So you see how it's written as r squared. So you could either have it as either 3 squared, or you could have it as 9. Both are either mathematically correct. Don't feel that you have to restrict yourself to either one. Personally, I like to keep it in the squared format because that just makes everything more uniform. But if you do have a preference for either, either one is going to be fine. Now to manipulating equations. OK, so what is this equation? Let's start with just the first part of it. Now we have x minus h squared. And what does this do? Now, first, we want to see, Parth, can I get a Cartesian plane? You're really great at this. Okay, so we want to see how does this make two points? Because a lot, of, uh, a lot of our equations, they'll just end up making one. So like a parabola uh, that's like this, it makes two points using the squared value. So what we're going to do 
is we're going to take, let's say, x minus, give me a number. 17. It's a horrible number to work with, but you know, you can make it work because you're you. Okay. So we're going to say that's equal to 9, which gives us a radius of 3. And we're just going to say that right now our uh, y minus k value is equal to 0. And 0 squared is 0. And what we want to do is we want to make these equal. So what we do is we need this to either be equal to 3 or, I'm sorry, this cursor is not really working well, negative 3. Okay, so then what we do is we got to find the values that make that happen. And the values that do that are 20 and uh, 14 because my brain is slow. Okay, so using these values, we plug them in and we notice that at the 14 mark, there's one line and at the 20 mark, there's another. But how does this make this beautiful curve and why does it end at a single point? Well, let's do this. So if we go ahead and we try to find, let's say, let's go ahead with this 17 value, which by the way is absurdly annoying. Thanks for nothing. Um, It'll be good we content. We go ahead and square this and now we have our y value. Let's say our y is, let's say, 9 up in the air. So it's minus 9 because, as part said, it's inverted. I'll get to y in a second. Um, we go ahead and make this still equal to 9. So Or 3 squared. Okay, or 3 squared. Both work. So if we want this to come at one point, we need this to only have, we need this x value to only have one value at the end of the day. So we can't have it have two it, values. Yeah. What what squared has only one value? And there's only one answer. The answer is zero. This has to be equal. This like whole thing has to be equal to zero for this equation that we have to equal to um to only have to only result in one point. And when that is equal to zero is when x is 17. So we know that this point must be 17, which, uh, which goes along with our theory of having a radius of 3. Now, why is this uh, negative, you might ask? So when you go ahead, I want you to go ahead and make a few equations. And you'll notice that every time you add one, add one to this number, it moves up one even though it is y minus something. And the reason for that is basically our y value, so our y value here basically has to end up as zero. Um, and so if we added something, we would end up with, let's say, y is nine, and then let's say we added nine, now we're squaring it in, now we have 18 squared, which is obviously, you know, not anywhere close to what we want. Um, I'm sorry if that didn't make too much sense. Uh, it's, it's, now it, you don't really need to know why, just a more nice to know. Yeah, they are inverted, and knowing that they are inverted will help you in a quiz. I guarantee you that. Um, that's about it. Thank you guys for watching. Yeah, I hope you have a great day. If you have any questions or if you have anything that you want to email us about or you want us to explain, just email us. It's at ucramweteach at gmail.com and it's going to be at our end screen as well. Thank you and goodbye. Also, our next, we have another video about this with practice problems. That so we do. If you, if you want to go ahead and move to that, that will show you more How we problems solve. using what we, what we proved here.